But little of what Jeremy Corbyn would do. He openly says he would throw all of our work away on day one by scrapping our white paper without having any idea what he would put in place instead. He says he wants tariff-free access to the EU, but cannot say if he wants to remain a member of the single market and with it remain subject to the rulings of the European Court and to European free movement rules. He cannot say if it means remaining a full member of the customs union, which would deprive us of our ability to strike new trade agreements around the world. These are the most basic questions that need to be answered, and yet we've heard nothing at all about them from Jeremy Corbyn. But we do know something that Jeremy Corbyn says he would do on day one. He would throw away our negotiating position at a stroke by rejecting the very idea of walking away with no deal. Now, I often say no deal is better than a bad deal because that is in Britain's national interest. Jeremy Corbyn seems to think that any deal, no matter what the price, no matter what the terms, is better than no deal. That's not leadership. That's an abdication of leadership. The bureaucrats in Brussels would think Christmas had come early if the British government adopted such an approach. Yet that is exactly what Jeremy Corbyn is proposing. And that's why he's not fit to negotiate a good Brexit deal for Britain. Yet on the success of that endeavour, Everything else depends. If we get Brexit right, then together we can do great things. We can build a Britain beyond Brexit that is stronger, fairer and more prosperous than it is today. And that's what my plan for a stronger Britain is all about. Fulfilling the promise of Brexit so that everyone in every community can enjoy the opportunity and security that they deserve. The opportunity and security they need. That means economic security, and it means physical security too. The Conservative Party has always understood that a strong economy is the foundation for everything else. If we are to have the prosperity, security and quality of life that we want, we must first ensure we have an economy that is robust. This belief in sound money and fiscal credibility is in the core of our DNA as a party. And as we face up to the challenge of leaving the European Union, it is even more important today. We hold true to it because we know that if you cannot manage your money properly, investment will dry up, <coughs> taxes will rise and businesses and the jobs they provide will flee from our shores. And it's ordinary working people who will pay the price. We hold true to it today because we know it's jobs and investment that provide the money we need to fund the vital public services on which we all rely. And above all, we know that it is wrong to pass to future generations a bill you cannot or will not pay yourself. Because every pound the government borrows falls to others, those who come later, including people not yet born, to pay back. If we're serious about restoring the contract between the generations, there is no more important thing we can do than seek to balance the books and pay down the debt. That is a simple matter of justice that only the Conservative Party understands. So we will show leadership and continue to take the difficult decisions we need to bring the deficit down. Ten years after the banking crisis, and thanks to the hard work and sacrifice of people across the country, the deficit is back to where it was before Labour let it spiral out of control. And thanks to our careful stewardship of the economy, debt is about to start falling too. So the government I lead will carry on with the job, getting the country back to living within its means, because a strong economy is the basis of our security as a nation. But that is not the limit of my ambition. It was right that we should take the difficult decisions over the past seven years to get the deficit under control. But the government I lead will do more. I'm determined that the next Conservative government will focus on growth and on driving growth across the country to build an economy that works for everyone. And that is how we will fulfil the promise of Brexit together. We will encourage businesses to set up and grow by cutting corporation tax to the lowest rate in any developed economy, because Conservatives know that's how you raise more money and attract more investment. Punishing businesses with higher taxes is not leadership, it's an abdication of leadership. A good soundbite for an election but a disastrous policy for our country. 
and punishing families with higher taxes is not leadership either. Yet that's exactly what Jeremy Corbyn's plan, with the independent, uh, Jeremy Corbyn plans, with the Independent Institute for Fiscal Pol Studies, saying his policies will cause the highest tax burden ever known in Britain's peacetime history. And that's not our way. We will keep taxes low. And we will do new trade deals for Britain's goods and services with new friends and old allies around the world because trade will be crucial to our future growth and prosperity. We need to be a great global trading nation once again. That's why we will create a network of trade commissioners across nine regions to lead export promotion, investment and trade policy overseas. And like all Conservative governments before us, we will bear down on regulations wherever we can and continue to regulate more effectively. But while a strong economy is the foundation, a fairer economy is vital too. That's why I want to do more to spread prosperity and opportunity around the country, as our new modern industrial strategy will do. It means keeping taxes low and helping people with the cost of living by intervening where markets are failing, by making markets work for working people. And it means guaranteeing a decent wage for all with a higher national living wage and not just protecting but enhancing rights and protections for people at work as we leave the EU. And with a strong and a fair economy, we will invest in our vital public services, give people dignity and security in old age with annual increases in the state pension and invest in keeping our country safe, retaining Trident, increasing the defence budget, and backing the finest police and intelligence services anywhere in the world. For keeping our country safe should be the number one priority for any Prime Minister and any government. Yet in this election, there is one leader who has made it his life's ambition to get rid of Trident, and one who is committed to keeping it. One leader who has boasted about opposing every single counter-terror law, and one who has been responsible for passing them. One leader who has opposed the use of shoot to kill and given cover to the IRA when they bombed and shot our citizens, and who now, in the midst of an election campaign, wants to do all he can to hide or deny those views. That's not leadership, it's an abdication of leadership. It's a failure to meet even the minimum requirement of the job of Prime Minister to keep our country safe. Safeguarding the security of our country takes leadership, that's why since 2010, in the face of a growing threat, we've protected the budget for counter-terrorism policing and increased the resources available to the security and intelligence agencies. It's why since 2015, when Jeremy Corbyn's front bench was arguing for the police to be cut by a further 10%, we've not cut the police, but protected their budget. It's why we've increased the number of armed police officers, improved cooperation between the police and specialist military units, and provided funding for an additional 1,900 officers at MI5, MI6 and GCHQ. Yet despite the progress we have made in recent years and the successes we've enjoyed, we must do more to respond to the changing threat to our country and our way of life. We cannot deny that the threat from Islamist extremism is one of the gravest we face. I believe it is right that the UK is engaged in taking on and defeating groups like ISIS and their like around the world. It is in our own national interest to do so, and it is in the interests of the wider world. But as our efforts to defeat them overseas are ever more successful, they are increasingly seeking to spread their poisonous ideology and to prey on the weak and vulnerable in our own countries, inspiring them to commit acts of terror here at home. They exploit the safe spaces of the internet and social media, and they exploit them in the real world too. The UK has led the world in developing a strategy for preventing violent extremism, and it has been highly successful. And we are leading international efforts to take on and defeat the ideology of Islamist extremism around the world. But as the threat evolves, our response must do so too. We cannot go on as we are enough is enough. We must do more, much more, to take on and defeat the evil ideology of Islamist extremism that preaches hatred, sows division and promotes sectarianism. 
It is an ideology that promotes a false choice between our Western values of freedom, democracy and human rights and the religion of Islam. It is a perversion of Islam and a perversion of the truth. And it will only be defeated when people understand that our values, pluralistic British values, are superior to anything offered by the preachers and supporters of hate. We must deny it the safe spaces it needs to take root and grow. Working with other democratic governments, we will agree ways to regulate cyberspace and prevent the spread of extremism and terrorist planning online. We will continue to support military action to destroy ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And we will do more to deny this ideology the physical space to breed here at home. That means refusing to tolerate extremism of any kind in our country. It means being more robust in identifying it and stamping it out across the public sector and across wider society. This is what we must do if we are to come together as a country and tackle this extremism in our midst. Not just violent extremism, but the whole spectrum of extremism, starting with the bigotry and hatred that can so often turn to violence too. And as I said yesterday in response to the attack on our country, the third in as many months, because of the changing nature of the threat we face, we need to review our counter-terrorism strategy to make sure the police and security services have all the powers they need. If that means increasing the length of custodial sentences for terrorism-related offences, even apparently less serious offences, that is what we will do. These proposals, set out in our manifesto, are founding, founded on a deep understanding of the threat we face. They may be uncomfortable for some to contemplate, but nothing is more important than keeping our country safe. That is what strong leadership is about. Stepping up, facing up, and doing what's right for Britain. That is and will always be my approach. I just want to do what's best for our country, to get on with the job in front of me, and to lead Britain forward. A year ago, I launched my campaign for the leadership of the Conservative Party in this very room. I said at the time that I'm not a showy politician. I don't tour the television studios. I don't gossip about people over lunch. I don't go drinking in Parliament's bars. I don't often wear my heart on my sleeve. And that's true. But I said then and I say now that if ever there was a time for a Prime Minister who is ready and able to do the job from day one, this is it because there's no time for learning on the job. The demands of the role are significant, the ability to master the details crucial, and the need to make big, important decisions inescapable. And with the Brexit negotiations, beginning just 11 days after polling day, we have no time to waste. So I offer myself as Prime Minister once more, with a resolute determination to get on with the job of delivering Brexit, Confidence that I can get a deal that works for all and belief that I have the vision, the plan, the will and the experience to fulfil the promise of Brexit and build a better Britain. That is what the election in three days' time is about. It's about who can provide the leadership to do what's right for Britain. And with the support of people across the country at the ballot box on Thursday, that's what I will do. Thank you. Now, I can take some questions from the media. Who do we, uh, who do we have here? Um, <laughs> Goodness me, it's a whole host of, uh, whole host of media. Gary. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, Gary Goodman. Thank you. Channel 4 News. Um, this morning, Chris de Dick said that in the light of the attack over the weekend, absolutely we need to look at having more police, more forensics, more intelligence officers. Do you agree, and would that mean you were wrong to cut numbers?